If you're here for the very first time watching online or in this room, let this thunderous applause be a statement of our gratitude. We're so grateful that you're here. And I want to I want to lean in. I know all of San Antonio has has a tremendous Latino presence. And man, moving to San Antonio six and a half years ago, I fell in love with just the culture, the people, and in this guayaveta. I just need somebody to notice that I'm wearing this guayaveta right now. I just need, it's got so many pockets and I love it. I'm like, just locked and loaded, man, locked and loaded. And so I'm grateful that you would be in the house of God today. I'm a pastor that really just believes that we're better together than we are apart. I, I believe with all my heart that we're in this together. I'm a fellow struggler. I don't have this all figured out, but I so love doing life with you. I care for you deeply, and it's an honor to have each and every one of you here. This is our fourth service of five, and this is not a labor of love. This is all love. See, I love, I love preaching, but I actually love people that I preach to more than the actual sermon. And Liz, just looking at you, you know, your beautiful family, and there's just so many people along the way that has made this such a sweet journey. I'm going to try to say the, the Spanish word for lip service today. It's labio serviso. It's loose, all right? Just, yeah, yeah, some of you are like, mm. <laughs> so it's the best I got right now, all right? So I'm working, I'm working. But I want to share a message entitled Lip Service. Here's the reason why this is important. So many times we hear messages, we got to be the hands and feet of Jesus. But it's time that we open our mouths and speak about Jesus. Amen. That God actually wants our lip service. Now, here, here's how this gets misapplied. We can be the hands of, and feet of Jesus, but if we don't speak, they won't know about our Jesus. But we can speak about Jesus and not be the hands and feet and miss what it means to be in a relationship with Jesus. So our, our mouth and our hands and our feet actually got to be working in congruence to speak and to preach who Jesus is. I don't want to speak to that today. If you got a Bible, the book of Malachi chapter 2 is where we're going to be at today, specifically verses 5, 6, and 7. Now, Malachi chapter 2, verses 5, 6, and 7 is really going to wrestle with this concept of what does it mean to be a faithful missionary and messenger on behalf of who God is. Now, I wanna share this target statement because I believe it's applicable for all of us, and this is the target statement of our sermon today. A saving faith was never intended to be a secret faith, but a shared faith. Our faith in Jesus cannot be the best kept secret. When I speak to teenagers, and let me just treat you like teenagers today and say it this way, I think you can understand it. We don't need any more undercover believers. We don't need any more secret service agents for the Savior. We don't need any more Christian ninjas that roll in and roll out and nobody knew you were here. We need some men and women and some young people that would say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's changed my life and I won't keep it to myself. But I've been so convicted. I got one day to spend with these brothers and go see our mission team. And I was so convicted about the fact that Lord Jesus, would you return to me a fire in my soul towards personal evangelism. I don't want to just preach Jesus from a stage. I want to preach Jesus off stage. I want to stop caring about what people think about me and whether or not they're going to be offended about my Jesus and just tell people because if hell is real and heaven is good and Jesus has made a way that we can have salvation and forgiveness, then why would I keep that to myself and hope by the way that I live my life, people would just maybe, just maybe find out that I have a relationship with Jesus. By the fact that I have character and integrity, now watch this, I've met a lot of people that have character and integrity and don't do what other people do, but don't have a relationship with Jesus. So it's not by the fact that what, yes, by our hands and our feet, by the way that we live and we serve, that people will understand that it's Jesus. Sometimes people look at other people and go, man, they're different, but they don't come to the conclusion it's Jesus. We got to tell them. And that's what God's called us to be about today. And in Malachi chapter two, verses five, six, and seven, the reason why this is important is because there's a lot of great verses in the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter one, verse 11, is this promise, the sun rises, the sun sets, and the fame of God goes forward for all the nations. You'll see it in Malachi chapter three, a very famous verse, stop robbing God, bring your full tithe into the storehouse, test God, and watch God pour out his blessing from heaven. Malachi chapter four would say it in verse two, that there's healing in his wings. It's the promise that the woman with the blood flow problem would claim. Malachi chapter four, verse two, there's healing in the wings of our Messiah. And then Malachi chapter four, verses nine, would talk about the fact that one day that God would send the spirit of Elijah 
turns, turns the hearts of the fathers back towards the sons and the sons back to the hearts of the father. Now we can look at that two ways. Was that John the Baptist? Jesus would say that, that it is John the Baptist, but we also know that one day in the seven years of tribulation, my humble opinion, up for debate for many people, I believe that the gospel is still being preached in the seven years of tribulation as the church has been removed from the earth through the two faithful witnesses, one of which I believe might be Elijah. And so Malachi unpacks all of this. But right in the middle of Malachi is Malachi chapter two, verses five, six, and seven. Here's the reason why. Because the priests that were serving in the temple were robbing God of the offering that was due his name. They would take the offering. Now you have to understand this. I didn't grow up in church, so I had to kind of deep dive on this. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. Many sons had Jacob. Y'all with me? His third son was Levi. Levites. They served the temple. Every firstborn son had the job of working in the temple. Unlike the 11 tribes, the 11 tribes were able to get land and they were able to eat from the produce of the land and they got their jobs and they got to keep their money. But the Levites, their job was to serve the temple. Based upon the offering that was brought to the church, the Levites lived off the offerings that came to the temple. Here's what would happen. They would keep the good for themselves and they would take the blemished things and they would offer it to the Lord and God goes, that ain't cool. They began to live for their own name, their own reputation. And they would actually, now watch how relevant this is for today, that the priests were not telling the people the word of God, but actually seeking to be more popular than to actually be in congruence with the word of God. And God calls them out, stop robbing me. And in Malachi chapter two, verses five, six, and seven is the standard that has been set for the priest to serve in the temple. Now, we're New Testament believers. We believe in the Old Testament. We believe the Old Testament points to the New Testament, and the New Testament makes more sense when we look at it through the lens of the Old Testament. But watch how this works. The priesthood of the Levites, New Testament covenant, Jesus Christ is our high priest. Hebrews 7 would say this, that that he has saved us to the uttermost. The book of Hebrews would say he is the great, faithful high priest. 1 Timothy chapter 2 would say there's one mediator between God and man. It's Jesus Christ. I want you to hear me, and I say this to you in love, because many of you have been raised up where you had to actually go to a mediator, to a priest, and have him relate a relationship with God to you. I will say this to you, and I say this humbly, that Jesus is your high priest. Jesus is your mediator. He is the one and for all sacrifice. It's not by the blood of bulls and goats and pigeons and doves, as the Old Testament would say, for the forgiveness of sin. Jesus died on that cross to save you, forgive you, change you, heal you, and give you a hope and a future. And right now, you go, Ed, what's Jesus doing? He's being your high priest. He's your mediator unto God. And we don't get to God without Jesus as our high priest. You say, Ed, so if Jesus is my high priest, then who are you? I'm your shepherd on this earth as a leader of this church, of which I do not take lightly. I will be held accountable for this role. Malachi chapter two, verses five, six, and seven is the standard and the benchmark that I have to measure my life to. But here's the reason why this is important is because as I seek to shepherd this congregation, there are a lot of men and women that I shepherd with. No one is more significant than the other. Yes, I have a primary role and responsibility to be the lead shepherd of this particular church, and I seek to use the shepherd hook, which is to draw you closer to God, but also if you get off course, I wanna bring you back on course to the teaching and preaching of this church and also the mission and vision and direction as this church goes. But see, everybody wants the hook come close, but they don't want the correction staff. See, when you sit underneath the pastor, you get the hook and the rod. See, when you walk with Jesus, you get the hook and the rod. What's the rod for? To fend for you, protect you from you, from the wolves that seek to somehow, some way, tickle your ears in popular, progressive, relativism thinking And all of a sudden, as you wrestle with what's going on in society, you have to have somebody that teaches and preaches God's truth, even when it's unpopular. Even when something being preached from God's word corrects or even says that this requires an adjustment. Moments where you may walk out of here and go, hey, listen, man, I I don't really care for Pastor Ed talking to me like that. Here's what I need you to know. 
My hope and prayer is that you will, you will be here the rest of your life serving at this church if God will allow you to do so. But I also know that there are people that are in the military that have PCS'd into this place and will PCS out of this place. And one day when you pick another church, you have to pick a church based upon not only what the church is doing, not just in programming, that's important, but you have to make sure that what's coming from the pulpit is thus saith the Lord, not persuaded by popular opinion. Now listen, we wanna have fun, we wanna be cool, we're not trying to be odd for God, but at the end of the day, uh, end of the day, we have to be in the direction of our chief shepherd, Jesus Christ, him and him alone. And so as we work through this, this is the standard that's been set. Here's the reason why, because I know there are people that come to this church and it's easy to blend into this church. And for some of you, you've come from other churches and you went through a church hurt and you're healing here and praise God for that and you'll go to another church. There's some of you that go, church is too big, just gonna be visiting for a little bit and then I'm gonna find a church I can get plugged into. I would say you can get plugged in here, but if God wants you to be plugged in somewhere else, I want you to understand what it looks like to actually be in church family with people under the teaching ministry from the pulpit. This is what I'm holding myself accountable to. But since you and I have what's called the priesthood of the believer, that you have a relationship with God, my role is to come alongside of you, encourage you, admonish you, but at times to go, this is what God says. The reason why I'm telling you this and the reason why I'm preaching Malachi chapter two is because the next series that we will walk into, we're gonna take communion together next weekend. We're gonna celebrate and honor all that God's doing. I'm gonna deliver a final message out of the Minor Prophets. And then we're gonna step into a sermon series called Trending. And we're gonna talk about major issues that culture has been pushing in the direction of what does the church say about this? It's not what the church says about this, it's what God says about this. And what we're saying is for the next five, six weeks, I covet your prayers. But I wanna go ahead and make this statement now. The next sermon series will be a defining, dividing marker in this church. There'll be people that go, hey, listen. No, thank you. The next sermon series will thin this church out, I promise you. There'll be a lot of folks that just pack their stuff up and roll out. And, that, and that's your choice. No, nobody will look down on you. Nobody will criticize you. But what we will say is this. We do not seek just to build a church based upon consumerism. We, we say, God, we ask in the name of Jesus. If we go from five services to four services and three services and two services, whatever your will is, God, we wanna rightly honor you in worship and in the word, spirit and in truth. And so Malachi chapter two basically is, is the guardrails in my life as I seek to be a faithful shepherd that God's called me to be here at CBC. But I wanna begin reading in Malachi chapter two, verses five, six, and seven. The word of God says it this way. It says, my covenant with him was one of peace and I gave them to him and it was a covenant of fear and he feared me. And here's what God's saying. This is what we gotta come back to. He's speaking to the priests that were at a lot of levels, people of not character and integrity towards the commandments of God. He says, this is what we need. We, we, we need men and women that will faithfully shepherd people that will stand in awe of my name a holy reverence, fear and trembling. My favorite verse in the Bible specifically that deals with fear is Isaiah chapter two, verse 22. Stop regarding man, he's just breath. So when I find myself wrestling with whether or not I'll be obedient to God or be obedient to popular opinion, I have to ask the question, God, who do I fear more? Man or God? God goes to Malachi, tell him, and I need someone, and point number one, write this down, with, that would ascribe worth to God. Worth to God. All of us worship something. Worship is not the problem. We all worship something. You go, Ed, what is worship? When, when we give our affinity, our affection, our attention to something that's primary, all of us have been West Coast chopper fabricated to worship something. Psalm 150 says, let everything that has breath do what? Praise the Lord. First Corinthians 10 what does it say? Whatsoever you eat, drink, or do, do all to the glory of God. Worship is life, and life is worship. When we talk about the chief end of man, what is the chief end of man? To, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. A.W. Tozer said it this way, that worship is to be an unbroken cycle before God, that we don't just worship in here, but we worship outside of here, that this would be the extension of what we do every single 
day. Listen to me. Four songs of worship is not going to sustain you. Four, four songs that Pastor Phil is trying to pick that would be in alignment with the message is not going to sustain you tomorrow. It may encourage you for today, but if you're like me, then all of a sudden you leave this place and it's easy to get distracted. And so the word of God is just reminding us of something that we are to be constantly preaching to ourselves. God, I got to go vertical with you every day throughout the day, walking in a rhythm that God, my life is worshiped before you. I'm moved by you that you have created me. You've consecrated me. You've called me. You've covered me before you formed me. You knew me. And while I was in my mother's womb, you have consecrated me. You gave me a purpose and a destiny. Oh, listen to me. Before we did this, God said, I have appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. You go, Ed, I'm a prophet. What is a prophet? Just a truth speaker. Not just interpreting the future, but making things that are so easily missed today seen again. And when you and I think about it, you go, I don't know what to say. God goes, I'll put words in your mouth. Don't you worry about that. I got you. I got you. And when we think about the words that God has in store for us, you remember Moses? Moses was called by God to speak on his behalf. And Moses was like, God, I don't know if you know this or not, but I got a stuttering problem. Not really good with words. God goes, um, hey, Moses, can we hang out for a second? Cool. Um, who made your mouth? Moses is like, oh, okay, all right, I, I see what you're trying to tell me. Here's what I want to say to you. Oh, we need lip service. We not only need the hands and the feet, but we need to be able to speak about God. And God goes, would you ascribe worth to my name? Number two, write this down. Not only do we ascribe worth, but we got to be acquainted with the word. Acquainted with the word of God. Verse six, preaching to myself. Oh, Ed, every day wake up. So you can't give people, Ed, something you ain't got. You can't lead people in worship if you're not a worshiper yourself. Preaching to myself today. I'm just hoping somebody's listening. Ed, you gotta be acquainted with the word, familiar with the word. True instruction was in his mouth, verse six would say, and there was no wrong found on his lips. He didn't twist and tweak and turn the word of God to make it convenient for culture. Culture doesn't define my Bible. My Bible defines culture. The grass withers, the flower fades. As to say, trends come and go. Hot topics come and go, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And so we gotta have an appetite for the word Job 23, verse 12. Anybody grow up? Man, I didn't grow up in church. Man, I, I saw Job for the first time. I didn't know it was Job. I thought it was Job. I was like, Job 23. Well, let me tell you what Job 23, 12 says. It says, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than the portion of his food. It's why we fast for 21 days as a church. It's why I push back from food, just saying, God, oh, I want you more than food itself. God, I long for your word. I want it more God, and may I find the nutrition and the value of it, knowing that it'll sustain me. It's what we do for 21 days. God, help me to know you that way, long for you that way, but not just have an appetite for the word, but also abide in the word. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and here's what the Bible says, Psalm 1, 2 would preach to us today, and he meditates on it day and night. It's called chewing the cud. You ever used that phrase before, chewing the cud? In agricultural terms, let me just go 4-H on you right now, right? Just let me talk to you. You're looking at me going, hey, you're the furthest thing from 4-H right now. <laughs> but when we, when we talk about chewing the cud, ca cows will chew grass, swallow it, regurgitate it, bring it back up again. You're like, we're trying to go to lunch, Ed. This is what you're talking about right now? Absolutely. They would chew it up, get more nutrients, bring it down, bring it back up, bring it down, bring it back up. Here's the reason why that's important, because they wanted to get every bit of the nutritional value in what they were eating. Can I say this to you? We live in such a microwave generation. We live in, we want instant success. We want instant godliness. We want instant discipline. We want instant fitness. We want, it's just instant, instant. And when we think about this, we have to understand that the crock pot of this movement of Christianity for us is getting and abiding, soaking and saturating in the word of God. Much like four songs won't sustain you, you can't just eat one meal a week and think that that's gonna give you vibrancy throughout the rest of the week. Can I tell you, I, I, I faithfully study, I faithfully try to deliver a message for you. I abide in the word so I can teach you how to abide in the word, but understand one meal ain't gonna sustain you. You gotta learn how to feed yourself. You gotta learn how to get in the word of God. 
I got an app. I mean, I've said this to you before. You can go to just the app store, Ed Newton. I'll send, I'll put a devotional in your mailbox, your email box every single day. Go to the app store, download the app. It'll give you a devotional every single day, 5 a.m., 6 a.m. It's hitting you, it's hitting your inbox. Develop a rhythm. Get in the word. Apply the word. James 1.22 says, don't, don't just be hearers of the word, but do what? Be doers of the word. But we can be doers of the word and not hearers of the word. It's both and. Now, I grew up a little bit different with two deaf parents, and man, times were tough. And I, I remember as a, as a kid, it was always a moment where my dad would just go to the grill, cook some stuff, invite some friends over. And one particular time, I'm sitting with my friends at a card table. Anybody ever grew up at the card table when y'all had company? Like the card table was not for card playing. The card table was like, that's where the kids sit. Anybody ever grow up at the card table? Come on. So I'm sitting at the card table, and you know how this works? Like mom and dad, they, they've not really thought a whole lot about what's gonna be the food for the kids. It's just like, it's dino nuggets, it's corn dogs, it's, it's like spam, it's like deviled ham, it's, it's Vienna sausages. Like real, I'm not even making that up. It's like all of those things together, and you go, that's the five basic food groups. That's what you need. As a ch- it's a miracle we're alive today, that, that, that we're alive today. Absolute miracle we're alive today on some of the stuff that we ate growing up. But when you and I think about it, that, that moment, we didn't know any better. Like I'm going, yeah, yeah, dad, I'll take a corn dog, some Vienna sausages, some dino nuggets. It just, it's amazing. Like just nothing but carnival food. This is all this is, just carnival food. Love it. And I walked over to the adult, adult table and my dad and my mom and their friends are eating steak, filet mignon, bacon wrap. I know not what this is. I'm like, what's that? My dad does this right here. And when that bacon wrap filet mignon landed on my tongue, it was a dance party in my mouth. And then my dad did this right here. (laughs) Who wants to go back to a corn dog? (laughs) Filet mignon, corn dog, corn dog, filet mignon. Listen to me. May we come to the place in our life where we're not having corn dog Christianity. That when we feast on the word of God, we go, hey, oh no, listen. I, I. So when you sit underneath the pastor, if, if you don't stay here, may, may they rightfully divide the word of God each and every week and show you the meat of God's word. Now, you know the challenge of a church like us? There are people that walk into this place that didn't grow up in church much like me. The challenge, and I actually love it. Coming into an environment much like this where I got the person that doesn't know, does not know anything about God's word and yet there have been people that have been walking with God for 50 plus years. The beauty of what we try to do here is to go, we're gonna catch the person that's got, it's the reason why I keep saying I didn't grow up in church just to let somebody feel like, thank you. And the reason why I don't try to just speak over your head, but just make sure that some level we're coming to this place of this is what the Bible says. My hope and prayer is that you don't walk out of here and and go, well, that was awesome. But instead go, God is awesome. And the word of God is awesome. And I can do that at home. I can do that in my life. And so as we apply the word, it now leads to point number three. Write this down, that we have to be aligned to walk with God. Now notice the rhythm, the pattern. I'm all about cadences. Yes, I listen to hip hop music, all right? So ascribe worth to God. Be acquainted with the word of God. Be aligned to walk with God. The Bible says in verse six, he walked with me in peace and uprightness. You ever been walking with somebody and been in an argument? walking in the same direction, but yet not on the same page. Moving in the same direction have a difference. See, to walk with God means you've made a decision to go in the same direction, and there's a distinction. Enoch walked with God. When you look at what the Bible says about Enoch, Hebrews 11 verse 5 says he pleased God. So when the Bible uses walk with God in walking with him, decision, direction, distinction, here's what the Bible is saying. This is what it looks like to be in a relationship with God. We're walking with God. You're, you're not leading God. God's leading you. He's not always kind of like, come on, come on, and you're fighting him. But instead, walking with you, God's beginning to point out and navigate and direct and articulate what he has in store for you. And when you and I think about walking with God, it really breaks down into these four concepts that we walk faithfully, we walk humbly, we walk blamelessly, we walk victoriously. I'll say it again. 
Faithfully, humbly, blamelessly, victoriously. What does it mean to walk faithfully? That we please God. Just two choices on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. We'd be faithful. Our yes would be our yes and our no would be our no. That actually we would do what God tells us to do. We walk humbly. It's Micah 6, 8. Do justly, love mercy. Walk humbly with our God. It's just a reminder. I'm preaching to myself today. It it ain't about you. Not about you. And I'd say this to you lovingly. It's not about you either. That it's walking in humility. God, everything I have is from you. I'm an owner of nothing but a steward of everything. That I'd walk blamelessly. That I would walk in the manner worthy of the calling that you've placed on my life. That actually I would not camouflage you, Jesus. I'd not cover you, Jesus, or conceal you, Jesus. May it not be said about me, Jesus, that I hid you, but instead may I be hidden in you. Don't let me hide you, Jesus. May, may I not be the city on the hill that turns off the lights. May I not put Jesus underneath the bushel. May the light of the world shine from me. May he shine from you. And when we think about a line to walk, it's coming into this place and what the word of God does for us, it aligns us. Had to get new tires on my car the other day. Didn't realize I was balding on the inside. Anybody had a moment where you went to the shop and you're like, wow, didn't expect that. But the vehicle, when it goes into the service bay, technology does this today. I don't know if you know this or not, but through these alignment tools are actually able to shoot lasers and tell you that your alignment is off. It's incredible. What happens in this moment, the alignment mechanism of CBC is the word of God. And when we talk about the word of God, oftentimes we don't even know this, that the spiritual journey of our life, it's like, you ever been driving and the wheel was off? You ever had the moment like my car was just, just shaking, like this ain't good. Like I, I, my, my shoulder's getting sore right now, just trying to always course correct this. And God goes, here's what happens. Coming into the, to the house of the Lord, which by the way, is so good. And I'm so proud of the fact that you come. You're like, Ed, do you know when we're here and when we're not here? Yes, I take attendance in my head, all right? So not really, but you are creatures of habit. You are creatures of habit. And I'm so proud of the fact that you come into the house of the Lord. And I want you to know that God is smiling over you. But you don't even know that this is happening. When you come into this place, what God is doing is course correcting. He's aligning your heart, not to me, not to the church only, but to the word of God and what God wants to do, which is why so many times people look at me and go, Ed, when you're preaching, are you, are you like actually talking to me? Yeah, I'm talking to you. Then somebody asks, Ed, when, when you're preaching, are you looking at me? I go, I I'm trying. I've had people go, Ed, it feels like you're staring into my soul. I'm like, I'm not that good, I promise you. And that sounds really creepy, right? Just to be honest, if I could just say it that way. Folks are like, how did you know I was wrestling with what I'm wrestling with? I'm like, I'm not stalking you on Facebook, I promise you. That's not, I, I ain't got time for that. For somebody that walks in this place and goes, man, it feels like you were just talking right to me. That is the word of God. That is the spirit of God. That, that's what's happening. Just aligning. God's aligning. But it's not just when you come to church. It's when, it's when you do this as well. The point number four, write this down. All of these things are good. We could give worth to God. We could be in the word of God. We could walk with God. But if we don't tell other people about God, then we miss our mission of why we're here. And point number four, we're appointed to be a witness for God. I love what the scripture would say. Malachi chapter two, verse seven, he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of the priest should guard knowledge and people should seek instruction from his mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. What was God doing? He was restoring integrity to the pulpit. That's what he was doing. And so as we walk in a day quite divided, quite disrupted, Here's what we have to understand. It's the word of God that continues to provide alignment. We have to be acquainted with the word of God and we give worth to God. But here's what we have to recognize. We've been appointed to share about God. And here's what I wanna do in the takeaway statement. We're gonna wrap this up. Here, here, here is the conclusive picture. I'm gonna show you a picture. Then I'm gonna show you a quick video that's like my video that is a reminder of why we exist as a church, real quickly. There are three circles I'd love to show. Pastor Jimmy Scroggins came up with this and I think it's brilliant. First circle, brokenness. It's brokenness. Would you agree we live in a broken world? Would you agree that we're broken people? See, the arrows that go forward from the broken circle, here's what you'll find out is people try to escape the brokenness and they try to find something that will fix the brokenness. But if I actually had a napkin, I'd show you this, that you could put 
more circles of brokenness at the end of those arrows because sometimes we chase things that will never satisfy. We pursue things that'll never fix the problem. We just somehow put band-aids over bullet wounds. That's what we do, that's our nature. We never really get to the root of the issue. But that was never God's intended plan for us to live in brokenness. Actually, the world was started in perfection, second circle, God's perfect design. God's perfect design was for us like Adam and Eve and just hang out and chill and just like do things that would just bring glory to God. No temptation, no sin, no judgment, perfect relationship with God. So how did we get the brokenness? It's not God's fault. I'll say it again. How did the brokenness happen? Not God's fault. Adam and Eve made a decision to eat from the tree of knowledge, good and evil and their choice, and here's the arrow, to sin leads to brokenness. And that brokenness has affected all of us. But God could have wiped every one of us off the planet, but he didn't. He actually provided a better way. For God so loved the world that he gave his son Jesus, third circle. He came to this earth just like us, but not like us, because he didn't sin. And he died on the cross for you and for me as sinners. But praise be to God, on the third day, he came back from the dead. Arrow down, cross, arrow up. He comes back from the dead and he went to heaven. And one day there'll be another arrow when he comes back down to get us. But meanwhile, here's what happens. Our Jesus steps into the brokenness and says, I got a better way. I'm the bridge that brings you to God's perfect design. In order for that to happen, we have to turn, which is repent of our sin and trust in Jesus. But it doesn't just stop there. We don't just miss hell and go to heaven. I got a relationship with Jesus, which means I grow in my relationship with Jesus. How do I do that? I give him worth, I get in the word, and I walk with him. And I grow in this relationship with him. But not only do I grow in this relationship with him, he actually calls me to go for him. And my mission is to go back into the brokenness of society in the spaces and places that need Jesus and recognize that Jesus picked me that he called me. He could put stars in alphabet soup and say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, but he chose us, he chose me, he chose you to go back into the brokenness with the message of Jesus that can bring about transformation to God's perfect design. And this is the last thing I'll show you. And I was like, how, how can I make this sticky? It's a video of a group of turtles. I'm enamored by this. I can't even stop watching this because I want you to see this. And you're like, Ed, where are we going with this? Check out these, this group of turtles. One turtle's flipped over. It's stuck, just spinning around, brokenness. But watch what these turtles start doing. They start moving in that direction, working together. Can I tell you what those turtles did not do? The turtles didn't look at the turtle that was struggling and go, Republican. <laughs> didn't, Democrat. Oh, from the east side, now we're north side people. South, south side, no, 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 south side. Didn't look at a color, didn't look at a culture, saw another turtle struggling work together, flip the turtle over. You go, Ed, what are you trying to tell us? That's us. How many people do you know that are just upside down trying to figure out what's going on and society goes, figure that out. How about this one? We as Jesus people know the answer and go, figure it out. And I have been so wrecked by the fact that I have been more fearful of rejection then the understanding of this person needs Jesus and God, maybe just maybe, it's called evangelism for a purpose because it's the good news, it's too good to be true and God help me not to keep good news to myself because everybody loves good news but when the good news is about you and my life could be restored to your perfect design, I can't keep that to myself. Come on, can we clap together? Would that be all right? This is the message today. Heads bowed, eyes closed for just a brief moment. You've been amazing to listen. But if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, my hope and prayer today is that you'd say yes to Jesus. If you have already given your life to Jesus, I'm gonna ask you a question. Do you know somebody that doesn't know Jesus? And would you be willing in the next couple of days to reach out to them? Pray a prayer, God ask me. I'm asking you to help me to be able to share Jesus with them. Pray that kind of prayer. But if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day. Call on his name. 
in faith and repentance, just say this to him. Let's all say this out loud together. Lord Jesus, I'm not perfect, but I believe in you. Save me, change me, I give you my life. If you just made that decision to give your life to Jesus and you're watching online, text in the number that's on the screen and our team's gonna show you a lot of love. But if you just gave your life to Jesus in this room, I'm gonna ask you to do something. It's gonna, it's gonna feel like, like super intimidating, but I want you to know we're gonna lose our ever loving mind when you do it. We're gonna cheer for you. If you gave your life to Jesus today, you say, it's real, it's legit. I gave my life to Jesus. I made that decision today. Would you stand up right where you're at? I want you to stand as tall as you can. How many of you would go, Ed, I gave my life to Jesus today. Just stand up right where you're at. Come on, anybody else? Anybody else? Gave your life to Jesus today. Made that decision today. Anybody else? God bless you. Come on, get a little bit louder. Anybody else today? High five them, hug them. Welcome to the family of God. Let's stand together if you don't mind. And as you stand today, here's what you need to know. All of us have been rescued from that brokenness and now we got a story to share. What happens if you go tell your friends and family about Jesus and they come back with you next weekend? And what happens if that friend that gives their life to Jesus goes and tells their friend? Then we got a movement. The world knows more about Coca-Cola than it does about our Jesus. And we got the real thing. We can't keep it a secret no longer. So Father God, we love you. We bless you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, when all God's people said, amen. Come on, give God some glory. We'll see you next weekend.